I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. It's always good to have everyone along for our little Bible discussion. Um, Jace, I, I found something I thought was interesting. Um, there was a, it, I actually found it on Twitter, but it's a, it's like a, just kind of an interesting little information. It's called History Defined. And they had something that I thought we might talk about here to get us going today. It was 10 strange professions that no longer exist. Mm. So you get the concept, 10, 10 strange professions that no longer exist. Cause you don't think about it, but hmm. jobs have their own, you know, lifespan, right? I mean, there are things at one time yeah. in history that are very important to the, every, what everybody's doing. But later on, because of innovation, they change. And so I was going to bounce these off of y'all and get your, get your comments on them. See what you think. These, these are 10 strange professions that no longer exist. And the first one is one of my favorites. It's the human alarm clock. The human. Alarm I didn't know clock. that was a job. The human alarm clock. This, this was the job uh, back in the 1800s and you wouldn't think about needing it, but so there were no alarm clocks, right? And you think, well, everybody just got up when the sun rose, but not everybody did, especially in cities. And so they would have these people, they were known as human alarm clocks, or they called them knocker uppers because they had these long sticks. And so like if you're, you know, where your bedroom was up high, second floor or an apartment complex, they would tap on the window. Or there was one method, which I thought this was pretty good. And there's actually a picture of this old woman. Uh, she's got a long straw kind of a dark looking deal. You know, one of those long things like they used to shoot the darts out of over in the you yeah. know, other country. And she would, they would shoot peas off the window until you woke up. So it was a pea shooter. And that was a human alarm clock to wake you up. So that was an actual job. What do you think about that? Jace? <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> So much to unpack there. <laughs> so much to unpack. That is, yeah. You know, I mean, Jace, this was a job you could handle. Yeah. No, Except I think you'd have to get up. I think if I would have lived back then, because I'm not a protester by nature, but I think I would have sat down and written a sign that would said that would have said, "Just say no to human." Alarm clocks. It's every man <laughs> for himself. Every man, woman. And I would child have protested someone knocking on my window or you know trying to wake me up. I, I would not have liked that. I would have gone freedom. We have the right to wake up on our own. That doesn't. Now, if you're late and <laughs> yeah. you miss the train, all right, you get you get fired. But I don't need you tapping on my window. I would think one shot, being careful not to hit anybody, but just shoot over their head when they got to hitting the glass. <laughs> just one. So boom. you went beyond. You went beyond that the peace. Yeah. Get, get get out. Get off my yard out there, hollering at me. You know, hitting the glass. Now, I will say. Yeah. I will say this. I will tell you a funny story though, just in that vein. So when I was in New York, you know, a few days ago. I found myself on uh, Missy and I were pre-recording. Everything we did was live, you know, promoting the show. And uh, Duck Family Treasure, it's out. Check it out. But and w but one of the uh, we got, you know, how breaking news happens, and and so we were supposed to be on the uh, water show or whatever, but something had happened, and so we we they said we don't need you anymore, which is very you know humbling or whatever. <laughs> It's like, we have more important news than you. They don't say that, but that was the implication. And you got bumped. Yeah. So somebody else picked us up then and said, well, we'll, we'll pre-record something. So I found myself in the uh, little green room waiting to be, to pre-record this, but we were going to use the same studio that I had just got axed from the water still. So it got awkward because, uh, the producer for the, I guess, I don't know who he is. There, there's a guy named Johnny. 
that goes out and interviews people for the water show, or whatever. Well, he's in the green room because their show is going on. Well, it was kind of awkward. He was like, well, I thought you were going to be on our show. I was like, yeah, we got cut. You didn't get the memo. Because you wouldn't <laughs> think you would see the guy, but right. we're going to use your studio when y'all are done, you know. But so the guest that I got uh, asked for was this guy named Jimmy Fallia, who's a comedian. And I've been on his show before. He's very funny. One of the funniest funny. human. He's never. Jimmy Fallon? No. Jimmy Failure. Failure. Yeah, I have Jimmy trouble. Jimmy So, and I was on his show, but he had a guest host. So it, it was getting weird because I'm bumping it. I was like, yeah, I did your show today, but I didn't realize you weren't there. And he's like, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> so, so I'm having all these awkward moments. Well, the other guy there, because nobody's there, this is the last show, is this Dr. Seagull. And uh, I'd seen him on TV before, but he was like, guys, look, do you realize that we're, we're what I'm talking about tonight? And we're all just kind of standing around laughing at this Jimmy's jokes. And he said it. At one time in our life, there was a job that we no longer have, and it was people who made bells for funerals. And because uh, what had just happened is someone, they were at a funeral in Ecuador. This is so it's a couple weeks ago. And they're doing the funeral, or whatever. And then they hear this knocking, you know. Well, they're like, somebody's knocking at the door, tell them to come in. They're just, dis they're disrupting the funeral here. No, it turns out it's the woman in the box who's supposedly dead saying, let me out. I, I, so they open the casket and this part is true story. This just happened. This person is alive. And so they were act, act they were uh, having Dr. Seagull on to discuss how does this happen? Which is, <laughs> so he's given his bit. He's like, well, the more research I, I did, I mean, the, the short answer is, this should not happen. You, 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 uh, so, yeah. But he said, believe it or not, <laughs> it's happened even in the U.S. twice in the last 10 years where we're at a funeral and somebody's not dead. But I know I've taken, I've hijacked your time. What do you do with all that embalming uh, fluid? Well, I don't know the details. I'm just telling you what happened. But I don't, I don't guess they had embalmed the Ecuadorian woman, but I didn't get that far down the rabbit hole. But what he yeah, said, they don't do that in a lot of part of the world. What he certain. said that was so interesting, which I want to say interesting jobs that we don't have anymore is we don't have what they would do back in the day, back in the same time period, is they would tie a string. It was a guy's That's job. Right. This was his job. They would tie a string on your big toe or your ankle. And if you come alive, you, that string goes up to a bell, and you, you start kicking your foot, and it ding, 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 ding. And look, <laughs> that is where we got the concept of, of, of two phrases, according to Dr. Seagull. That's where we got the concept of saved by the bell. That didn't happen in a boxing ring. That happened because somebody started ringing that bell, and they, <laughs> they dug them back up. <laughs> And that's also where we got the concept of dead ringer. That's a dead yeah. ringer. The dead, dead ringer. is ringing the bell. Yeah. It's time to get that person out of yeah. the box. So sorry I hijacked your top ten, but no. I just thought that was too fascinating because here no, I am. You're right in the having a conversation I mean, with you these got, guys. You got you got ten of these, Al. Oh, you're right, Jace. Jace, you're right in the spirit of it. So one of the other uh, one of the other jobs that's on the list. Is a job called the resurrectionist. Okay, well, which I thought, I'll, I'll which I thought was interesting. Now it wasn't that particular thing because I have read about what you were talking about and Dr. Seagull was talking about, but this, these people, this is before modern medicine, obviously. But you know, when they started doing autopsies and studying human cadavers, they were trying to figure out anatomy and all that. So again, we're talking about seventeen, eighteen hundreds. I guess maybe back further. And so you didn't have really people donating their body to science like they do today. So these people, they call them resurrectionists. That was their job. They would go out and rob graves and steal bodies and then sell them to medical universities or colleges at the time to be able to do these you know, experiments and try to figure stuff out. So that was an actual job. 
wow. was to go out and steal bodies until it became illegal, <laughs> of course. Well, the I mean, word you point, never want to hear the ne- in, in an autopsy is ouch. <laughs> <laughs> that, now, Jay, that could be a T-shirt right there. <laughs> all right, so let me just do a couple of others. Obviously, we don't have to do time to do all 10, but here's one I thought was interesting. Here's a good job, Jay. You could have done this job. Leech collector. For, for so doing, you know what I'm talking about? For medicinal purposes? Yeah, for, for medicinal purposes because they used to use leeches to, to mm-hmm. drain blood out of people. I think that's and what so got the, President George, George, didn't he? His With, collection what? of leeches. They put the leeches to him to, to help, help his body. Of course, he didn't, he didn't last long after that, but I mean. <laughs> I, th- George I think maybe Washington, the leeches. George Washington, I heard. I mean, I read somewhere. Maybe the leeches didn't do their job, Phil. I, well, the idea was the idea was if you could just get that bad blood out, we could fix the problem. The problem was, as we now know, it wasn't just in your blood. But it so didn't, here, it but didn't here's work what I, with President Washington, evidently. They, they, they tried here's it. what I thought was interesting. They had two ways of doing this. One, for a guy who didn't have any horses, would just have to go into the water in a swamp somewhere and collect the leeches on his body. That's how you collected them. Yeah. And but if you had a, if you were a little bit more better off, you would take an old horse and you would let him loose in the swamp, and then he, the horse or she, would collect the leeches. So this was a leech collector job, and then they would sell them to doctors. And I thought that was interesting. Well, we've come a long way in a few hundred years. These days, I don't see many leeches, but when I was a boy, there were more leeches than there are. I now. don't know. The last time I went frog hunting and I dove. And caught the frog, and so I had I literally went under the swamp, the lily pad. The last time I went frog hunting, I I kept feeling like because you don't know you have so much debris on you when that happens, but I just felt like uncomfortable or like I'd been in somebody was watching me. I didn't know what it was, but when I got in the shower, I realized what it was. I had four leeches in the nether regions Uh-oh. who had taken a boat. <laughs> And boy, that was uh so you know, my first attempt was I said, Missy, I need some help. And she when I thought she was gonna pass out due to just, you know, thinking there's no way I'm going anywhere. You're on your own. Call nine one one was basically her message. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I love you, I'm here for you in sickness and in health, but you're on your own with getting leeches off your body. I'm out. <laughs> so I carefully removed, you know, I got a, those needle nose pliers and, and just worked it out. But, them but, one, but it made me think there, I mean, I just had one, that, that's a lot of leeches to acquire in one jump in a swamp. Yeah, yeah, it was. So maybe it was a family or something. At one time you could have sold those. So the last one I'll do, I may save some of these for a later podcast. Jace, you could have done this job rat killers so rats were so bad in big big cities and had all these diseases that they would send men into the sewers and the tunnels to kill rats and then they would pay them for how many rats that they brought out so they were trying to you know of course they were fighting an uphill battle because all those cities still got a lot of rat issues but uh, there was a picture uh, in the thing of the a guy cities. coming out with two big rats. You know, yeah, way out oh. here, there's a lot of rat killing going on. I will here say this: all the I, time. I took a guy duck hunting one time, uh, for, you know, not too long ago, and I said, "What do you do for a living?" And he said, "Well, I actually work for a special part of the government that we go in when the there's imbalances with critters in areas." that like there's too many rats or there's too many he said we go in and balance the situation now he said it very uh (laughs) eloquently and i said no what i said what department of the government is that and he said well i didn't say that (laughs) and i thought we're doing that our taxpayer dollars (laughs) and he said yeah but I said, well, where can I see some information? And he said, I didn't tell you that. So I didn't know <laughs> if he was kidding or, <laughs> but I think that job may still be uh, happening today. It's just somewhere deep down uh, hidden in the secrecy right next to the CIA, I guess. 
you know, don't hurt yeah, the poor they, animals or something. Well, that's what I'm yeah, saying. They don't make a big deal, but I think that is happening in our world today. Somebody can send I, us an email and clarify that. Well, that's I'm what actually boy, Jace, I'm buoyed by that idea. I feel much better to know that the government is doing something. Well, that's very what useful. he said. Now look, I'm gonna he, just he imagine been, my tax money is going to that, and then I'll feel a lot better about it. Somebody so look, uh, look into that. I had yeah, a man that knocked on our door about a week or two, and he had a bucket in his arm like that, and he said, I I'm here to uh, put this rat poison out. And yeah. I said, all right, get after it. So I, I watched. Was of, he from uh, the government, or was he did this? No, he, just, he, just, uh, okay. he had a bucket of rat poison in his arm, <laughs> and he told me that. I said, well, get after it. So. I'd say he th stayed about 35, 40 minutes. He went around behind the house, mm -hmm. up under the house there, some, some. So I don't know exactly, you know. Yeah, I'm not sure what Al's point. I think that's still going on, though. Yeah. It's called, well, uh, I guess you're right. Pest they, control. Well, may, maybe not in the form it used to. It's not just the wild, wild west where you go down and shoot them and bring yeah. them up and get paid. Oh, for them. Okay. You know, I had a rat infestation here a couple oh, years let's ago. Let's not relive that, Phil. I, I couldn't eat for two days <laughs> after that. Uh, yeah. that you you, notice you, you did, did you notice there was a, a decline in visitation from your family after you told that story? <laughs> That's oh, yeah. true. My daughter said, I want to go see Memo Kim and Pepo Phil, but. After I heard about the rats, I, I think I'm going to tell them, if y'all want to come see me, you know where I'm at. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's take a break. To my knowledge, I have two pair of Tommy John underwear. Two pair. Are you saying you need more? <laughs> well, you can only wear two pairs so long, and then you got to come out of something. <laughs> You know, well, you know, so what I'm saying is I have two pair, but my drawer there is full of underwear, but they're whiteies from years ago. Yeah. Well, I get one of the two, and then, you know, after about, you know, I, I, I extend it to about a week, but I, after a week, mm. I, I, you just, you know. There's seven days there. a week. So What I'm uh, saying is I need at least five a week's worth of underwear. Yeah, if you change them every but day. But I didn't want to holler. I, I don't go underwear shopping, go up there and say, you know, you got to No, it's too weird. It's creepy yeah. at this stage of your life. Oh, well, you, know what you, you know what you call those tidy whities in your drawer? I don't know. Relics. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the whole drawer. It, uh, that's what they are. And then there's some crazy looking ones down in there. I mean, you know, they're not Tommy John. To that be, may be from uh -oh. your youth, Phil. Uh oh, <laughs> might have been. I don't know. It matters because uh, Tommy John underwear, which is uh, is who sponsors our podcast, but we've been wearing them. I've been wearing them for years. Uh, they have breathable, lightweight, moisture wicking fabric, and that's the key. Uh, and they're four times the stretch of other brands. And so when you're out there uh, active, especially in this heat. Uh, that's what you need. Trust me, is this product. They've sold over 20 million pairs, which obviously means that they're very popular. Uh, they like to say that they don't have customers. They have fanatics. Um, they, and they have a uh, best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guarantee. So they stand behind their product. If you don't love them, you can send it back. But uh, I think you'll love them. So keep cool and comfortable this 4th of July with Tommy John. Get 25% off site-wide at TommyJohn.com slash Phil. That's 25% off at TommyJohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. All right. So that was a few few uh, jobs. I had a few others. We'll drop those in a future podcast. We need to get back to Luke 6 or we're never going to get finished, Jay. Exactly. Because this sermon on the plane has turned into the sermon of the decade. Well, it did. But we, we had to break the, uh, just for us, because we do the a lot of these podcasts back to back. And we got into the deep water on just exploring the nature of God, which is, I think, good to do every once in a while. And so, uh, but I, I once said, I didn't know if the term apologetics came up to, to, you know, I didn't know why they named it that other than maybe they need to apologize after they're finished for not being clear. <laughs> Man, y'all, I'm telling that, these jokes was, today and there's I, literally. I got it. I was. I was waiting for Zach to respond because I felt like that was aimed straight at him. Can so, we so, like yeah, drop I, I, in I some cricket <laughs> noises during the podcast? I mean, I know we just go from one end to the other yeah. without any edit, 
But I just think it would be funny if when I say a joke like that and nobody laughs, we could just have a cricket sound. So. Or maybe if I could just do this, because, you know, the cricket sound actually comes from them rubbing uh, two of their little tentacles together. So when I do this, Jays, that means okay. we're hearing crickets. So, yeah. Well, maybe it just crickets, wasn't funny. Crickets. So please take us to Luke 6 and let's go. So we have been talking about the, uh, we've been called the Sermon on the Plain. It's a compilation of some sort of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 through 7. And it could just be Luke sort of repackaging is what it seems like of the same information, or it could actually be another speech or maybe one of Jesus' stump speeches, but he does have a different twist. And so we were talking about the blessings and the woes is where we started. And that was a really interesting discussion about this idea about not just in a spiritual sense, but also a physical sense of this earth versus the kingdom and the kingdom mindset. So we talked about that. And then Jesus, the last thing we talked about in this section before we get to today is that he lays out sort of what we were calling the, I don't know, what would you call it, Jace, the seemingly impossible blueprint of, of how to love people. Cause he takes it to another level. Yeah. He made the point. Go ahead. Well, it just, he, you know, we laid the foundation and we did it around. There's, there's really two different kingdoms. Any kingdom other than Jesus's kingdom, which is doomed to fail. But you got to remember, throughout Luke chapter six, all the gospels—Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John—what keeps coming up is is uh, the rebuttal of who Jesus is. We've already looked. We we've covered it and said. Jesus is 100% God. He had a lot of difficulty because they said, isn't that Joseph's son? Doesn't he? Yeah. Isn't that the one? I mean, they're trying to get around who Jesus is, and he keeps proving that he is, in fact, God in flesh. Well, he does. And, and to your point, Phil, he's healing diseases in verse 18. Yep. He's, uh, he's driving out evil spirits. But he's also giving messages about what this new kingdom involves that is contrary to any kind of worldly success understanding. And he is looking, he's using language like in verse 23 that we didn't talk a lot about, but it said rejoice in that day, you know, of of being insulted because of him and Mm -hmm. maybe, uh, you know, being humble and 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 weeping, yeah, and, and hungering hungry, and thirsting. Yeah. You know these these concepts that we all equate with being comfortable and powerful. And but he says, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. Well, you know, for them to hear a guy, you know, your natural response is, well, how do you know about heaven? Who are you? Yeah. Your point. And so look. It gets worse when we get to verse 27, because he's talking about rejoicing when you're persecuted and, you know, having more clarity when you're poor. And then get 27, he says, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic give to everyone who asks you and if anyone takes what belongs to you do not demand it back do to others as you would have them do to you if you love those who love you what credit is that to you even sinners in quotations love those who love them and if you do good to those who are good to you what credit is that to you even sinners in quotations do that and if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, which is another crazy statement for a human to be saying. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked be merciful just as your father is merciful that's a lot said 
And I've worked on that one for years. It still takes a lot of work on that one because, you know, somebody slicked yeah. it, you know, come up there. They, 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 yeah. Money. Well, and I, I think that's the point, Dad, is because – he lays out the standard of who he is because, and I said this before in a podcast, everything in this list, Jesus did Yeah, while he was here. So he showed us the way, yep. but he also knows this is the hardest thing to emulate and to be like him. Well, it's also one of the more controversial passages because people will Men go to them well, without expecting to get anything back. It's a, uh, it's a tough, tough road to go down. People will go here and say that, oh, you know, God is, is uh, you know, for injustice or whatever, and they, they make uh, teachings that I don't think was his point. Uh, so I think it is something we need to discuss. I mean, uh, you know, even when Jesus was on trial and they struck him, and, and Paul had a similar circumstance in the book of Acts, uh, you know, Jesus called him out on it. And so when you really look at this and say, well, what, what is he saying? Because we know that God is a God of justice. And, and I think when you start breaking this down, how you treat people who insult you and oppose you, because I thought about the one that the most glaring thing that sticks out to me that is the most difficult to do is it says when someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to him the other also. That's just not in my nature. If, if if somebody would do that. But when you think about it, what is that? It They also, in their culture, would kiss each other on the cheek as a sign of greeting. Well, if you were going to attack somebody, if this was about some kind of ending injustice in the world, slapping somebody on the cheek, you know, I'm not, I'm not into this, uh, what do they call all these fighting, uh, what's J? MMA. Uh, yeah, the MMA, MMA and Jay's the doing food. all the uh, what are, uh, you know whatever they do. What is that? I don't even know what it's called. Jujitsu. Jujitsu. Yeah. Well, I, I know this: that slapping somebody on the cheek is not a point of of impact where you're trying to, you know, kill them or it's it's done in a. This is all done in a way of they're insulting you, they're persecuting you. I think it's feeding from the previous verses. And I personally think that when he says love your enemy, that don't mean you're happy about this in the in the short term, but it means you don't want to burn the bridge here. You're you're not so when he says turn the other cheek, I'm saying you're giving them another opportunity because that's what we do. You think about it, if somebody attacks you, what is the ultimate go? The ultimate go is to share Jesus with them and let him change their heart and turn them into a productive human well, being. Well, it's like but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. And in the case of Yeti Ice Chest, I've just noticed that more of them leave here, oh. I never see them again. Well, I got that same problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I so didn't. I'm saying, I, I didn't know where you, know, you were going just with so that. So many ice yet, but they are leaving as fast as they borrow them. So I'm like, well, no, you're right, and I've had to repent over that. I've had a lot of people. Who, no, I'm saying my friends. We're not talking. About, I'm not talking about my enemies. Yeah. I'm talking about my friends. Say they will say, let me borrow. You. Can I borrow your ice chest? Because you know I got a whole <laughs> fleet of them, and I just looked up one day, and I thought, what happened to all my ice chests? I looked up, and well, I mean, they were all gone. And, thought, it, well. and it rightfully so makes me angry. But uh, so you, you can – that's my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hang on, Jace. Hang on. What about let's the fifth ice chest, and you begin to say, they may be my enemy. <laughs> Hang on, Dad. Let's take a break. So, Jace, uh, I guess it's safe to say that a uh, clean weapon is a, is a good thing. I just think that when it comes to weapons, I mean, they're dangerous. So there's a responsibility that we were all taught at a at a very young age. There, there's got to be a tutorial given. But part of that being responsible 
is learning how to clean and maintain your weapon. Yeah, and you know, it's uh and it's not just the idea of accuracy and safety, but it's also uh just makes for a better weapon uh, over the long term to make sure that it's clean and it's functioning. Uh so they have a 3D cylinder is what they use and you have one there Chase in front of you for those that are watching. And so this is a white polymer uh, it doesn't leave behind any residue particles. It's a cleaner that doesn't make a mess, which is a great concept. Uh, it cleans by scrubbing and collecting particles, then absorbs any remaining residue and buffs the interior surface clean. So it really is an important step. Uh, it doesn't have to be messy anymore. We want you to check these guys out. They're a great company, great Christian company. With it. We love that about them as well. Uh, and they're like us, a small business that has a great idea. So check them out, Barrel Buddy. Dot com b a r r e l buddy dot com. Yeah, so Yeti's notwithstanding, uh, I, I do think that's exactly what you see here. I've always seen it, Jesus, as like Jesus is showing us two clear distinctions of the kingdom. I mean, his kingdom, and then he lays it out. This is what I would do because he comes back with that kind of strange. Uh, I would call it conditional worldly perspective when he's and he's doing the air quotes around the sinners because he knows we're all sinners. But he's saying he showed you a picture of conditional love, conditional kindness and conditional business, because let's face it, in all three of those ex examples that he gives us is if you do one thing, you expect something back. But he's saying in my kingdom is not that way. I'm offering you something without condition. I'm offering exactly. my love. I'm offering my kindness. I'm offering uh, my paying it forward mentality instead of paying it back. Stinginess is out. It's out. Right. It's, it's out. Well, I just brought up the point, though. I think, you know, I had a guy one time. He's like, well, you know, does this mean if somebody tries to break into your house, you know, and you're just supposed to let them? I'm like, of course not. Th there's a difference, I think, he in the context of what he's saying about the cost of following Jesus, you're, you're going to have people that arise against you and they're going to persecute you. They're going to insult you. It's not, he didn't take a time out and say that you let, you know, injustice and, and people who are out to commit crimes against your family, or even when you get into the different types of war settings and why people fight wars and different things, this was not the manifesto you know, to oppose all injustices. That that is not his point, in my opinion. I mean, I'm I'm no. welcoming your thoughts, but when you when you do some research on this, it seems like that's where everybody goes from the scholarly viewpoint. And I thought, hmm, I don't think that's his point. No, and and another clear thing, Jace, he shows you the clear distinction on talking about how we deal with one another and how we deal with the world. And they're completely different. In fact, I think that's the setup for the next section that he's going to talk about in judging and condemning. I mean, he, cause you know, the world condemns itself. And so I, I think he starts talking about what your qualifications are. We want to be like Christ. We want to love people. I think to your example would be more from an idea of someone tries to do something like you described. We defend ourselves, but when all that's over, we would be like, Hey, I'd like to, you know, tell that guy why I believe in Jesus. Exactly. You know, in other words, it, it, it was not that you don't want him to be forever in heaven. You know, you just could deal with each moment as it comes, a kingdom mindset. So, I, I, I mean, that, I tend to agree exactly with the way you laid it out. Yeah, I mean, our, our greatest weapon, I mean, to quote Paul in Corinthians, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Our greatest weapon is the declaration of who Jesus is and what he did for him. That's it. So... You know, unfortunately, we we are persecuted and we have enemies, and but we do defend ourselves if they break the lines of you know what is acceptable, you know, on this earth. I mean, if they're putting your lives in danger, you know, we're fully capable of, and I think called out to defend ourselves. But in the end, we want to give people Jesus, and that's and people may do that to stop you from declaring Jesus. And, uh, you know, we'll defend that to the death. But we're also, which is very difficult to do in all these situations, because this is getting where you live. You know, it's just, 
it's so hard to forgive people and to not let their actions make you just say you're dead to me. You know, you know, when they insult you and steal from you and and insults, in, you know, in a in a public way, which I think this, you know, slapping somebody on the cheek, even in the European community, that would be, you know, they'd take their glove off and slap you across the the face as a public display that I don't like you. You know, I'm insulting you. So the turn the other cheek is not so they can slap you also in in what I'm reading. It's more about you're going to offer them another opportunity to change. It, it You're not just saying, that's it. I will never say another word, you know, as long as it's in the insult persecution realm. So I think, Jace, to prove your point, like Jesus defended himself several times before he was ready for his plan to be implemented. I mean, how many times we read about them ready to kill him in a moment? They picked up rocks. They rushed him. There were times when they were like, okay, we're going to kill you right now. And what did he do? He, He disappeared. He, you know, he pulled his his, you know, ability to be able to get away from him. So, I mean, until he was ready to implement the kingdom plan of giving himself that that those mobs were not going to do that. So I think that's a perfect illustration of exactly what he's talking about with us. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to read that one. I reference. I I wasn't sure where it was. It just popped in my head. But in the John 18, because this goes. Hang on, Jace. Before you read that, let's take a break. This goes to the the issue at hand, which is turn the other cheek. So in Matthew 18, 19, when he was being questioned by the high priest, it says, Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And he says, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. So, I mean, Jesus is defending himself in a moment of injustice. Yeah. So then it says, when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face, which seems like, so what does he do? You know, you're like, well, he, he well, you're supposed to turn the other cheek. You said that. And that's why I said, I think they take that out of context what his point was, because watch how he responded to that in this situation. In the As he struck him in the face, it says, is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? Well, watch Jesus. He defends himself. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? So I just think when you read, read that in context of what it is and go back to the spiritual principles that are applying on what the kingdom looks like in Luke 6 he's viewing these moments of insults and persecution that's coming your way because of him and yes you have a right to defend yourself and and stand up for justice but we're also not burning that bridge if later on there's an opportunity to bring this person into the kingdom the phrase, no, I think, the, the verse, it says, love God and love your neighbor. Uh, to put that into practice, it, it, takes, uh, it, it takes some uh, patience and some soul searching. Yes. You love God and love your neighbor all the time. Exactly. And not to say that we've arrived. Look, this is, I think, the most difficult thing to do in life as a Christian for me. It's very it difficult. is to look at people who have mistreated me and find some open door to reconcile, you know, what, what has happened. I mean, it is just everything, our tendency is to not want to be around these people ever again. Yeah, I've taken a few curses, uh, quite a few, but, uh, you know, it's something, you know, it's, I, and when people come to me and say, this is what happened to me, I'm saying, look, just forgive them and move on. Yeah, it's just hard to do. Though. <laughs> oh, I know it. But it is the difference, I think, in Christianity and every everybody else. So I think, and, and let me read this next text, because I think it leads us into it perfectly. 
if Jesus is stay, saying, I set the standard, so, you know, you have to appeal to me to be able to do that, Dad, to your point. I mean, it takes really having faith in Christ to do what you just described, I'm right? I'm telling you. Because he's the ultimate example. So when we get to verse 37, he's going to do it again and uh, a couple of new concepts. And it's interesting because Luke sets this up kind of like he did with the blessings and the woes. He starts out with two things not to do. Then he comes back with two things you should do. And it's really interesting because this idea of being like Jesus, I think, really applies to this text because it's kind of like what we're qualified to do and what we're not qualified to do. And that's how he says it. He says it this way in verse 37. Do not judge. Now, this is right on the heels of loving your enemies and being merciful like God. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. So that's the two things he says you're not really qualified to do. And Jace, to your point earlier, people have taken this so far out of context because they take it to say, well, I should never care what anybody does in any context because the Bible says don't judge anybody. I mean, I've heard that so many times out of people who who don't understand the context of this. But then he hears what he says you are qualified to do. Forgive and you will be forgiven. So these are things you can do. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, talking about what you receive, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be used to you. So it's an illustration in the old days of like grain. You know, you see somebody pours it in a bag and you shake it, you know, and it kind of settles down to the bottom and you keep pouring it in till it flows out of the top. Yeah. That's the idea, he says, when you give, this is the response that you get back. Oh, you see that. I mean, look, I've always viewed this as... Most people tendency, their tendencies are when it's when they're the guilty party, and I've been that many times. Well, I want a dump truck filled with grace poured on me. But if somebody <laughs> wrongs me, I want to give them a teaspoon. <laughs> yep. You don't want anything overflowing. Exactly. I know I'm just being a hundred percent honest. If you analyze your life, that is the way we function. Because we know we have to do it. We, we've read the verses, and we're like, but we don't take these near as seriously as other verses. We're like, I know i got to forgive them, so I guess I will. But I'll tell you this, I'm gonna, there's, there's some burning coals heaping on your head as I'm extending you this teaspoon of grace, just a window of hope. But when we're the guilty party, we're like, well, good grief. Well, I made a mistake. I don't know why everybody's all riled up here, you know. I, I mean, said we, I was wrong. I said I was wrong. Let's move on, you know. Where's the, <laughs> the dump truck? Back it up. Pour it out. Beep, 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 yep. Beep. And now let's go on about our business. Now, look, if y'all deny that is really going on in our hearts and minds, it, it's just the truth. <laughs> That's the way we operate. So the part about the judging. It's difficult to be full of grace and you just got slicked, and it, it's it's difficult to deal with. So, yeah, because you have this sense of, like Jason said, you have this sense of, I, I was wronged, and so my rights. How many times have you heard that in our culture? Am I right? I have a right to this. I have a right mm -hmm. to that. And all that's true, but the idea is that sometimes I'm just like, okay, I'm going to give up my right for you to have a blessing. I mean, exactly. that's the hard part for people to wrap their heads around. Let's take our last break. Well, I think the con I'll get into the controversial parts of this because I think we have to. There, context matters, and I keep making a big deal about this. And so this part about giving out grace, you know, all sin is the same in that it is contrary to what God wants us to do. However, some sins have greater consequences to moving forward. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because, you know, if someone is abusing kids or something, which I find at the top of the list as far as grievances that I get upset about, I mean, I'm hot. Now, I know deep down because people say, well, you got to forgive them, you know, 
But then there's another group of people saying, well, what are you talking about? I mean, that because they they want justice, and we're getting back to this issue. Look, I'm like, lock them up, do whatever the most severe thing that that is that is true, and I'm I'm gonna that teaspoon of grace may be administered in that just to say, if there's a chance we can share Jesus with them, let's do that. So I'm not saying that it that everything fits perfectly in that light. There are grievances of sin that declare uh, us dealing with the consequences in greater, you know, degree. And that gets into, you know, firing people and the, the consequences of their sin means there's going to be more consequences from even brothers in the church. They, and they should be severe depending on how great the consequences. I'm fine with that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested in y'all's take on it. But here, once again, it is in the context of these things happening with the disciples of Jesus making him known and people that they're interacting with that are, uh, you know, accusing them and persecuting them. And they're going to be coming up with these claims about why are you judging me? I mean, who are you? And I think it's coming from that place. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is about the judging. And, I, and this is a little controversial, but when you read first Corinthians five and, you know, they had a lot of problems he goes into this dissertation because they had a really bad thing going on in their church with a supposedly, you know, there's a, what does it say? A man has his father's wife, so maybe it's a stepson, whatever. But we have sexual immorality, you know, in the church. And he gets down to the end in verse 9, and he says, I've written you in my letters not to associate with sexual immoral people and then he says something interesting, not at all meaning the people of the world who are immoral, the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. But now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother who's doing these things. Such a man don't even eat. Then he says in 12 and 13, which is where I wanted to get to, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? And there's a question. So it's an understood answer of it's none of your business. But then he says, are you not to judge those inside? Well, what is the answer you think he's implying? I would say yes. Then he says, God will judge those outside, expel the wicked man from among you. And I only bring that up to say there's a different standard of how we operate when it gets into sinful behavior and in our interaction of those people outside of the church and those people claiming to be in Jesus. And that's why it's so difficult when I go to these news shows a problem. in a secular world and they say, what do you think about? And they'll say some kind of social, you know, sin or some problem going on in our world. Because at that moment, I'm like, well, look, <laughs> I'm going to share Jesus with these people. Well, they don't like that answer because they're like, well, we want you to address the specific thing. And I usually say, well, there's two different conversations here to those in the world. I'm going to point them to Jesus because there's no sense in me going down, you know, an argument about what they're doing if there's no basis on which they would form an opinion on whether it's right or wrong because they don't care about Jesus. They're and so, but inside the church, well, it's a different kind of meeting. Oh, I'm in a. If someone is doing, and you can find any list of sins, and they're claiming to be a follower of Jesus. We're making a judgment as a body, and the judgment is you're not acting in line with the truth of who Jesus is. So having said all that, because I didn't want to take up the whole segment, I, I did feel we needed to discuss that and make that distinction. That's well said, Jace. No, I, I tend to agree. And I think that's why that I kind of viewed what Jesus was talking about is being qualified from the divine sense. I mean, in other words, how could I possibly judge, you know, the world or condemn the world when I don't know the hearts of men and women there? But you're right. When people in fellowship of making a decision to follow Christ are all in one group of people, whether it be the church, the kingdom, whatever, uh, of course, we try to help one another. And to do that, you can only, as he put it, judge what's right and wrong among you. And that's a different context. And so I, I think you're right. I think that's why I made the point earlier that I think people try to apply that to everybody, but that's not the point he was trying to make. 
Yeah, he I was think, saying these yeah, are the right. things you can't do. He was in a context of describing what we do in the kingdom. You know, there's a God and we're not him. And, you know, there's a judge and we're not him. This is not, we're out there pointing people to Jesus. He was giving them an admonition. These are the qualities that you're going to have to embrace as disciples of mine, especially when you're declaring Jesus as the son of God. And when it comes to enemies and when it comes to making judgments and you're out in the world and you're, you're doing this, you can't all of a sudden stop and get on a stump speech about, you know, making judgments on social matters of the people that's what's going on. I mean, you're, you're wasting time, I think, is the point. And it's just not your job. And I think he shows that by the things he tells you not to do because it doesn't help the kingdom versus the things you should be doing. You, yeah. Why you shouldn't be judging and condemning, you should be forgiving people and giving to a point that the, what you will receive in return will be so much more valuable. And I don't, I don't think he means just you're giving to get. He's saying what you will get when you yeah. give to the level he's talking about will be beyond what you can imagine. Exactly. It'll be way better than just, you know, putting money in a pot somewhere. So then let me read the end of this and we can discuss it in the overtime. So then he goes on to say, he this is verse 39. He also told them this parable, can a blind, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No, that's good. And I think he, he it's interesting because he gives us a couple of parables that tie into the thought and process. And then let's face it, Jesus is just being funny. I mean, what he describes is funny. I mean, he's given you this huge hyperbolic picture of this person with a speck in his eye and imagine just this huge beam coming out of the other eye. So I, I want to talk about that some more in overtime because we're out of time uh, in our regular and our shame. So if you want to follow us over, we're going to have a little more discussion about this idea of judging others. Go to blazetv.com slash unashamed is where you get our overtime comments. So we'll see you on the other side. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.